Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. That's a little bit bright today. I'm very washed out. I'm quite a ghostly white person anyway uh, and the sun really isn't doing that much for my complexion so that's why I look a little bit spectral in case you wondered. So first of all there are a ton of new people here. Um, I did not expect this at all but the Radiohead guide's done so well. I think it's been the best video I've put out so far in terms of views and likes and comments. So thank you for all the support on that one. Welcome to all you new people. I hope you're enjoying the content. I hope you're enjoying the discussions uh, and hopefully you'll stay on board with Deep Cuts into the future. Also quickly, I do need to say before I continue this video, because some people are complaining they're not receiving notifications when a new video for Deep Cuts goes live. If you're not receiving notifications, even if you've pressed the notification button above the subscribe button, you just need, you need to follow me on the other social media platforms and then that way we won't have any problems. So if you follow me on Twitter at Deep Cuts Tweets, I tweet on there regularly and I also send out links as soon as new videos go up. And then also on Facebook, um, you can follow me at Deep Cuts Face. I know it's very original. Um, if you follow me at the, on that handle, then that will also be updated as and when new content is received. So then you shouldn't miss out if YouTube decides to be shit, which it does invariably do. So let's jump into what I listened to in March of 2017, and there are a handful of absolute belters in this list. So me, Petite Afrique. I put this record at the beginning of the video because it's one of my absolute favorites of the month. It's an expressive, intelligent, tantalizing album. Somi is an African-American musician. She was born in Illinois and she now lives in New York City. Uh, her parents are from uh, Ugandan and Rwandan heritage. As such, her musical identity is a vibrant blend of jazz and African influences. And a lot of those are informed by the experiences uh, of the culture and the life centered around 116th Street in Harlem, which is also known as Little Africa. This is the topic this record approaches. Petite Afrique is a genuine cultural hive, yet it's being threatened by the gentrification that's slowly seeping from Manhattan and into the suburbs. This is the reason the record carves out such a satisfying experience. It's deftly handled the idea of championing a community, um, and the whole idea of, of cultural diaspora is wrapped up so well with the American jazz stylings converging with those African sonic influences. You know how some conceptual ideas for records can come across a little trite? Um, this is the complete opposite of that. Uh, Somi is a very intelligent person. She's a creator, a musician, but also she's a cultural anthropologist. Therefore, she completely understands the idea of diaspora and is able to represent that thematically through her lyricism and also through her music as well. She's directly discussing the changing cycles of life and society and culture, but she's not just doing that in a really obvious way through the lyricism. It's, it's reflected through the music, which is such an impressive thing to do. Not only that, but she focuses on the musical traditions of three different ethnic groups, the Wolof, the Fula and Bambara. And that just gives the record a true authenticity. You have nimble jazz piano brushing up against djembe. You have upright bass alongside talking drum. There's this brilliant coalescence of sound. Everything here is quite honestly a triumph. The, the dramatic strings on there like ghosts that rise and fall alongside this um, electro-acoustic hybrid drum beat. And Somi's vocals are robust and humane at the same time. Black Enough is infectious and brimming with eloquent flourishes like the big band horns and the offbeat drumbeat. If you're not sold on the idea of this record, you need to listen to the track Holy Room first. It's an R&B ballad preaching love and forgiveness to the world. It's, it's profound and musically stunning. Ugh, I love this record. If you're only gonna listen to one record this month, make it this. Blank Mass. World Eater. So this was probably my most highly anticipated release for March. I loved the last Blank Mass album, Dumb Flesh, which was released in 2015. And if for those of you that don't know, um, jo Benjamin John Powers is the man behind Blank Mass. He is also one half of Fuck Buttons, and they've released a spate of unbelievable records. So I was pretty hyped for this release. Initially, it was hard to put my finger on what exactly wasn't clicking for me with this album, because there's so much of what was in the previous Blank Mass album is here. You have the barraging electronic sequence beats you have at the murky electronics, that sense of scope. That's something that Powers has always been very adept at creating, whether via blank mass or fuck buttons, is, the, is that scope, uh, that scale, whether that's through carefully plotted crescendos or just sheer force. But I feel like the issue with the record for me lies a lot in the track sequencing 
There are really good tracks on this album, but they are obscured by other tracks that aren't perhaps as good. And those other tracks are so um, barraging in their force uh, that it, it offers a bit of a fragmented listening experience. Straight out the gate, first track, John Doe's Carnival of Error, sounds funnily enough like a twisted carnival sound, and it really works as a prelude to the second track, Rhesus Negative. For all its apocalyptic choir vocals and 16th note rhythmic flurries, I just, I don't think this is a very strong track, certainly not as an opening track. If you look at the strength of openings on uh, Blank Mass's last album, Dumb Flesh, or on Fuck Button's Slow Focus, or Tarot Sport, um, they have really engaging openers, and for me, that the opening track the carnival of error going into rhesus negative is not a very strong way of starting a record it's not until we reach the track please that power's ability to craft atmosphere truly comes through and that's simply because he's not just persistently throwing loud at the canvas the entire time an expression i know doesn't really make sense throwing loud at a canvas but but you get what i mean the deep bass synth sounds rumble under the r&b fragmented vocals and the fizzing claps in a way that's deeply oppressive and power's wrote this record in response to a negativity-filled 2016, you know, a year where a lot of crap happened. And I think you can uh, finally hear that, uh, that idea expressed musically on this track. Final three tracks, Silent Treatment, the track in the middle with three names that I can't remember, and Hive Mind as well. Those three tracks feel like a continuation of the track, please, and they're fantastic. They have this underpinned menace with glittering rushes of beauty, and that's where the uh, the songwriting of Powers really comes into play on this record. Definitely an uneven release. I feel like if you added Please to the final three tracks, it would probably be a really strong four-track EP. Uh, but I still think it's worth taking a listen to this record. If you haven't heard the previous Blank Mass record, Dumb Flesh, you should definitely go and listen to that, I think. Mount Eerie. A crow looked at me. I'm not really sure how to approach talking about this record. It's something that's been expressed by critics and reviewers over the past few weeks since the release of this album. It feels almost tasteless to discuss it in terms of, ly of lyrical or musical merit in the way that you would normally do. For those that aren't aware, Mount Erie is the project of Phil Elverham, a singer-songwriter who is, has always succeeded in acutely capturing the often wondrous, often painful experience of life through a blend of lo-fi, indie, folk, slow core influences. A Crow Looked at Me, however, focuses on the even more painful experience of the death of a loved one. You know, nine months ago, Phil's wife Genevieve died of pancreatic cancer, leaving Phil to raise their baby daughter alone. This is the epicenter of the record, a heart laid bare confessional of a man who has lost his soulmate. You know, descriptive words would probably sound like hyperbole or embellishment if I tried to capture to you the engulfing pain that just permeates every single song on this record. It is heart-wrenching. I'll make no bones about this, this is a very difficult listening experience. It's almost too personal. You feel like you're reading the diary of someone who has lost someone. I mean, effectively you are because that's what this songwriting is. It's the minute details that really get you. Things like uh, in one of the tracks, Phil, uh, is remembering the fact that Genevieve will still be receiving posts, therefore he's got to deal with seeing her name on letters delivered to her as if she's still there, but she's not. Uh, so many difficult experiences, like the, the horrible serendipity of the fact that his uh, the ther their therapist died not long after she died as well. And there's, there's a line about um, saying that they walked past the office and saw that the light was off as if her job had been done. And it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but it, it's just, it's, it's a very difficult listening experience because you are listening to, the, it, this isn't a constructed grief, this is real, raw grief that someone's really going through. True grief is not something that's often used in music. There'll be a, a you know, if there is grief there or, or this music is based on grief, then there's a layer of artistic sheen to it to make the music more catchy or more appealing or whatever. That's not this record, this record is Reef is typified by the meandering guitar arrangements, the light piano, the gentle tapping, Phil's vocals that sit somewhere between musical and, and spoken prose. Phil himself called the record barely music and I can see where he's coming from. You won't come away from this album humming any of the tracks I don't think, but in a way if you did that would probably cheapen 
the subject matter. The melodies and lyrics slip in and out here, much like the intense waves of grief that Phil must be experiencing. I think you'll go away probably not remembering a single song. I mean, that's, that was certainly my experience on the first listen. But what will remain is this heavy sadness and exhaustion for feeling sympathy for someone who has, has really suffering from the loss of a loved one. Everyone should listen to this at some point. Paul Bearer, Heartless. I cannot explain how happy I am to say that this record is brilliant. Paul Bearer are a doom metal band from Arkansas, USA, uh, and they've already released two formidable records, the 2012 debut, uh, Sorrow and Extinction, and then 2014's follow-up, Foundations of Burden, which was a sophomore record that cemented the talent of this band. The quartet have gained a huge following over the past few years, and I think that's largely down to consistency of their musical vision operating within the confines of the monolithic. I realise that phrase probably doesn't make any sense but just hear me out. The insistent pummeling guitar riffs and the muscular drums carve out a devastating landscape. You know, nothing's done by halves on this album. Every single track um, has the same approach, it's, it's got the same heft and the same power. You know, even though the album is over an hour long, that energy just doesn't drop a jot throughout the entire record. Opening track I Saw The End is a great example of the band utilising a slow tempo and that barraging riffage to achieve that doom metal sludgy expression. As the band reached the end of a four bar sequence, drummer Mark Learley rips out this, this booming triplet fill and then the whole band rush into the first beat of the next bar with this imposing power, it's just sublime. Again, typified in the epic closing track, A Plea for Understanding, uh, which is even slower, more colossal, more unstoppable, and Brett Campbell's vocals just soar across the track. On a side note, it's like optimal headbanging speed as well, I'm being serious, try it out, listen to that final track, A Plea for Understanding, it just feels so natural. This is what the band work with sonically, but there are moments of experimentation on this record that, that, have, that have been added into the sonic footprint of the band seamlessly. The proggy ballad opening of Dance in Madness, which has this guitar solo that sounds like it's straight out of the John Petrucci playbook. You have those dramatic synths layered underneath the track Live Survival. I think that wherever they go next, they're gonna have to probably experiment a little bit more because as, as great and as consistent as this record is, and the first two records were, I don't know how many times you can repeat that trick. So perhaps for their next record, they'll maybe experiment a little bit more and push that out even further than they have on this record. But nevertheless, this is a, a really great album and you should go and listen to it. The Shins, Heartworms. Ugh. Disclaimer time, <laughs> I've never really been a fan of The Shins as a band. I've had a lot of people come to me and proclaim the greatness of albums like Shoots Too Narrow and Wincing the Night Away, but I just don't get it. I find much of their material a bit plodding, unfocused, and most of all unmemorable. Uh, the number of times I've tried to listen to these records and get into them, but nothing retains my interest. I, I don't know what it is about their songwriting, um, that it just doesn't capture me in the way other people seem to be captured by it. So I suppose there wasn't really much of a chance for Heartworms to do anything other than bore me, and sure enough. To be honest, for me, the most frustrating thing about Heartworms is how most of the tracks seem to sound just like a mess. Take the second track, Painting a Hole. There are so many instrumental lines meandering in and out of the track that it just becomes such an unfocused listen. I can't catch onto anything. Just It's just such a collage of sounds that just, they feel like they haven't really been Nothing's really been properly thought out. Instead of letting ideas breathe, Mercer and co seem so insistent at acting clever and cramming in every little idea that fits that one chord sequence. Cherry Hearts is a loathsome little shit of a track, those obnoxious bouncy synths and uh, Mercer's vocal delivery which drips in reverb. God, I was, I was irritated at this point and that's the third track in, so this album had no chance for me. It's just all a little bit too twee for me, unfocused, messy, uh, I feel like they're trying to be really clever with everything here and nothing comes off clever it just comes across as a, a, a record that's been played with infinitely uh, and and nothing good has come of that um, I just I just don't understand it really did not like this album if I hadn't made that clear already spoon hot thoughts I spoke about consistency as strength earlier with Paul Bearer's record and spoon are a band who have consistency in spades they have spoons of consistency <laughs> <clears throat> Spoon are a Texas four-piece that create tight, 
indie art rock. They have this real clear affinity of creating songs and records that effortlessly groove and soar, and they remind me sonically of a cross between the focus of a band like TV on the radio and the ragged energy of Les Savvy Fav. Uh, there are two bands there that you should definitely check out if you have never heard them before. Hot Thoughts is Spoon's ninth record, which fits seamlessly alongside 2014's They Want My Soul, 2010's Transference, 2007's Gar 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 Gar, and 2005's Gimme Fiction, etc, etc, etc. Every track here is an excellent construction, succeeded in creating something immediately engaging that never overstays its welcome. It's a really brilliant, art rock record and I'm loving it. To me this record feels like Brit, Daniel and Co have moved on from the previous record They Want My Soul and created something that's even more joyful and playful. It feels like they've really enjoyed creating this record. The slow burn intro of track Whisper, I'll listen to it, is, is masterful, a deft use of dynamics and layering. And once drummer Jim Eno's beat kicks in, you'll just find your limbs are taking on a life of its own. It's like you're transported to this glittering dance floor. It's such a brilliant track. Again, it's the meticulous attention to detail that bolsters the songwriting on this album, whether it's a keyboard layering or a gentle guitar phrase that's only there momentarily. It makes repeat listens an absolute must. First Caress is a piano-led four-to-the-floor stomper with hints of twinkling psychedelia. The whole thing's led by Daniel's very self-assured vocals. The slippery synth line and the chorus of Can I Sit Next To You, it just complements the funked guitar so well uh, and Daniel's low hum. That the instrumentation here and the layering, everything on this album, it, it's so rich. I could take in any track as an example uh, and, and could, you, could, you could just list all the different layerings that make it so engaging. Weird, I only just did the Radiohead Guide actually and um, the track Pink Up has a piano phrase in it that sounds just like the beginning of Bloom. You should check that out and see, see how similar they are. Alongside Somi's Petite Afrique, this is my favourite album of the month. So two favourite albums of the month. Um, it's, it's astonishing that Spoon can keep releasing these really well crafted, captivating records. Fantastic stuff. Laura Marling, Semper Femina. I've always had a bit of a strange relationship with Laura Marling's music. Not with Laura Marling, I've never met her. <laughs> She'd be so lucky. I've followed her on and off ever since her debut, 2008's Alas, I Cannot Swim. Uh, and, and from those humble, folky beginnings, she's crafted this, this curiously idiosyncratic approach to songwriting and arranging that could be heard even just on her second record, which was called I Speak Because I Can. Despite her unique process of writing and her approach, I've found that her music always feels a little bit at arm's length to me. You know, despite the seductive warmth of the arrangements and the production, I feel like the emotion never really pierces through, and as such I end up acknowledging the skill of her as a musician without ever really connecting with her music. At this point she's only 27 and releasing her sixth record, Semper Femina, which is an insane feat, that's such an impressive thing, especially when you consider the fact that all of her albums have been well received critically, she hasn't really had a misstep at this point, um, and really she seems to be continuing to forge a path for herself in her career that likens her to like a, like a modern day Joni Mitchell. As with previous record short movie, Marling is uninterested with trying to appeal to a certain demographic. You know, she makes the music she wants to make, and in, in that way she, um, she is the, a true musician and artist. The opening track, Soothing, has a smoky atmosphere. Acoustic string instruments and dusty drums provide textures for Laura's celestial vocal tone. Don't Pass Me By is anchored with these floating, clean vibrato guitar arpeggios and these, these bass drones. The whole track is creeping and reflective. To be honest, as I listen through this record, there's very little I can fault. Uh, it's confident, assured songwriting. It's very original. Laura's so capable of creating a, a unique atmosphere that, that perfectly complements her vocals and her arrangement styles. But again, I just can't warm to it. I listen through with interest and intrigue, but I come away and, and nothing's really got me, got me there in the heart. As someone who talks about music a lot, obviously. <laughs> um, it's frustrating for me not to be able to pinpoint exactly what I don't quite get about Laura Marling's music. I really want to have a conversation about this, about this in the comments. If there are any of you that are big Laura Marling fans, uh, le let's have a discussion about her because it intrigues me that I can't quite um, I can't quite connect with her music and I want to know if other people have had a similar experience, so let me know. But yeah, it's, it's a strong album and I think if you like Laura Marling's music or you love Laura Marling's music, you're really going to enjoy this because her songwriting is on point again. Um, but just personally, again, it's just for me just another 
cannot connect to. But there we go. Like I said, let me know your thoughts on that. Idols. Brutalism. Bristol Quintet Idols have just released their debut album, Brutalism, a dazzling, ragged punk album that has a real edge to it. It's pretty unusual these days to find a band so closely following the abrasive path of 70s punk legends like Stiff Little Fingers or the Sex Pistols. And I'm not just talking about the oblique ferocity of the tracks because that is there musically, but uh, the punk aesthetic is really embodied by frontman Joe Talbot who uh, has a, a political edge as well as an acerbic wit. So he's able to muse on the bleak, um, the bleak landscape of post-Brexit Britain, but there's also the track Stendhal Syndrome, where he um, he humorously talks about art and perspectivism, and there's some really funny lyrics in here. Did you see that selfie, what Francis Bacon did? Don't look nothing like him, what a fucking div. It's great. There's obviously a modern edge to the music too, and the dynamic use of production uh, cements this album in the contemporary setting of 2017. Track Well Done is exemplified by its angular guitar chords and piercing snare hits, and Talbot's vocals growl over the top, they brim with conviction. Elsewhere on the record though, the band also exercised their affinity for melody. You know, the chorus of Rachel Koo, it breaks in like sunshine on the track before throwing back down into that pounding verse. Final track Slow Savage is completely different to the rest of the record. It's an, an atmospheric distant cut. It has underwater piano uh, plonking alongside Talbot's lamentations that are, that are very personal this time and more abstract than before. If for example he talks about um, saying to a lover, because I'm the worst lover you've ever had, I'm the worst lover you'll ever have for two years in a row I forgot your birthday. The lyrics here are a lot more personal and I'm glad they don't break through too much on the rest of the record because it has a real focus uh, lyrically the rest of the album. But it's nice to see that at the end of the record and I'm excited therefore to see where the band takes their sound in the future. A damn exciting debut album. Check this band out because I think they're going to grow into something really special and this, this album's great. So that's my March 2017 roundup. There's loads of records that I've missed out. I know as always I haven't had time this month to listen to more than more than the records I discussed and, and collect my thoughts about them. Anything I've missed discuss it down below. Let's talk about the records that I did talk about as well. What your thoughts were on them. Do you agree with what I say? Do you disagree? Um, and I'll be back next week with another video. See you then.